Acton Acton, welcome to We Have Ways of Making You Talk with me, James Holland, in New Orleans. And I've got two very exciting guests with me. I've got a friend of the show, Saul David. Saul, how are you this morning? A little bit jaded after last night? Pretty good. It was well worth the, uh, the visit to the French Quarter, or we were near the French Quarter. The Blue to- Nile, listening to Kermit Ruffins. Fabulous jazz. Uh, but yeah, great, great trip to the conference so far. Um, and I'm also here with Henry Sledge, who is the son of Eugene Sledgehammer Sledge, um, author with, uh, with the old breed. You know, one of the, one of the great memoirs to emerge from the Second World War. And Saul, you've obviously, you, you, and, you and Henry were doing this sort of scare today at the conference and talking about Devil's Dogs, your, your new book on K Company, um, which was obviously Eugene Sledge's company um, when he joined them in, for, for Peleliu and Okinawa and all the rest of it. Um, and Henry, you kind of grew up with the, with the legacy of this, didn't you? I, I mean, did. I mean, the, what you were saying yesterday about, about watching him write this book, I just thought was amazing. It, I saw it come to life, and, and I had that endemic love of World War II history ingrained in me, not because he wanted me to be that way. It was just there, you know, growing up in the time I did, the movies I watched, the shows like the movies like Kelly's Heroes and Patton and, and the shows like Hogan's Heroes and Rat Patrol and, you know, those... I just had a love for that stuff. And, and, you know, when you're watching these war movies, I mean, Al, as you will know, um, used to kind of watch war movies with his dad and, and they just sort of, you know, every other Saturday would be sitting down watching um, Bridge Too Far and so on and getting annoyed about the leopards on the bridge. But, but, but would you sit down and watch movies with your dad or was he not into that? He was not into that. No. Now, if, if he saw something that, that if he would pass through the room and see a scene that was amusing in some way then he would comment on that but being into war movies was not his thing i mean he felt like he had kind of already seen it so he had no desire to but he had no problem with me watching war movies right but 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 you watched Patton with him didn't you i did we that was i was about six years old and i watched that movie again later in life but that particular night yeah we we sat down to watch it. My brother talked him into it. My brother, I was six. My brother was probably 11 or 12 at the time. And it, the scene where they are in Tobruk, and it's just those relentless explosions, one after the other. And my father became emotional, went into the kitchen and just started pounding the refrigerator. Wow. And my mother got him to sit down and, and calm him down. But, but then we found out later that when they were under heavy shell fire, they would just pound the ground in sheer desperation and frustration in, in their foxholes. Incredible. Did you, did you see this? I mean, did you think at that moment, gosh, okay. I, I did. I mean, and being six years old, I'm just, I'd never seen anything like that before. No. You know, that was the most visceral demonstration. And of course I had no idea because that was long before with the old breed came out, but, right. um, which is what 1981 with the old breed was published in 81. But yeah. that, that was the most overt display. And, and there were, I'm sure Al would remember this, little plastic Tommy guns with the clickers and you pull the trigger and it goes. Yeah. yeah. I had one of those and, and I was fascinated by the Tommy gun. And my dad carried one through Okinawa, he and Snafu did. And I was probably about nine years old. The pantry in our kitchen was like a full length pantry. You open it up and, and you had vegetable goods and things like that in there. And one night I decided to hide in there and jump out at my bed and, and scare him. And I heard Ooh. him, I heard him come. So I'm, I'm, I'm feeling, I'm feeling, feeling tense about this anecdote already. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, but no, I'm, I'm hiding in there having a little plastic Tommy gun. Like I said, I was eight or nine and I hear him coming down the hall and he would frequently whistle or hum to himself, you know, and, and he, he turned the corner, came into the kitchen and I pushed the door open of the, the little butler of the little pantry there and jumped out at him with that Tommy gun. And he spun around and I'll never forget the look on his face. He just, he wheeled around and looked at me with an expression I had never seen before. And he grabbed me by, he would have called it grabbed it by the stacking swivels, by my shirt collar. And, you know, he, he, he didn't lose control, but I could tell it just triggered something. Yeah. yeah. And he braced me up, and then he went in the other room and got his belt and gave me a whipping. <laughs> and he said, don't ever do that again. Wow. Wow. But but it was not, I mean, I, I, I can't emphasize enough. He, 
it's not like he lost control. It's not like in that moment he just turned into this this person I had never seen. He was my father, and I knew I had crossed a line. Right. Mm. Did you know when you were stalking him that it's something he, you know, that it might scare him, and you, you didn't care, you did it anyway? I, I'm, gonna, I'm going to answer that by saying yes, and in my eight-year-old mind, I thought it would be funny, but here's the thing. I mean, I remember when my brother and I were, were young, my mother telling us, if you need to wake us up in the middle of the night, don't go to your father's side of the bed, come to my side. I will wake your father up. Hmm. And that stemmed from a conversation, it might have been with Sid Phillips after they were married, um, because he had probably said, don't, don't ever shake Eugene by the shoulder, don't do that. Just, right. And she said, well, what if I need him in the middle of the night, what do I do? And, he said, lean over and whisper in his ear, Sledgehammer, wake up. Amazing. <laughs> wow. Which is what they would have done in the foxholes. Yes, yeah. and because and, one guy would stay awake, yeah. one guy would sleep. But, yeah. <clears throat> um, and I remember my mother describing in an interview leading up to the Pacific miniseries that she, she one night she tried that, and she said he was just instantly awake. Like his eyes just opened and I felt him tense up. That's absolutely incredible. There's a horrific moment in the in the with the old breed, which I included Devil Dogs Henry, uh, where he's awake one night, you know, doing his stag duty, which is what we call it in the British Army, which is stag staying duty. awake. Mm -hmm. uh, and his comrade, who I think was Snaffer, was asleep. Now this is this is the story where the foxhole in front, both guys are asleep. Can you can you explain what happens next? Yeah, that was I want to say that was over near the West Road on Peleliu and. There was a, a nearby foxhole, and I think he was dug in with Snafu that night. He frequently dug in with a guy named George Surrett, another mortarman, but that night it would have been Snafu. And he just, in, in the moonlight, and of course, in with the old breed, he describes the moonlight, because it was usually really dark on Peleliu, he mm -hmm. saw two Japanese come running through. And honestly, saw it, it's, I don't want to try to recreate that story because it ends up being a horrific tale, and it is confusing. But what the bottom line, one Japanese soldier breaks off and runs down the road toward the CP and they hear shots there. And the other one jumps into the nearby foxhole where the two Marines were asleep. One rightfully, rightfully so, the other having fallen asleep when he was supposed to be keeping watch. And my father describes how, and with the old reader, he describes this horrific, just animalistic sounds and they're punching each other. and. I think the Marine ends up trying to gouge the Japanese soldier's eyes out with his thumbs, but he ends up, one of them ends up getting shot. And then another Marine crawls out in the darkness to check on, to check on who it was. And, and he ends up getting shot by one of his own men. Eugene is looking straight ahead. As Henry says, he spots these two guys coming across the road. One of them gets into the foxhole directly ahead. There's this terrible struggle and no one quite knows what happens. Then this kind of, Silence ensues. Someone leaps out of that foxhole and runs away. Now, for some reason, another Marine who's in a nearby foxhole assumes that the guy who's got out is, is a Japanese, Japanese. Yes. Because you never got over out of your foxhole at night. That was the right. golden, golden rule. rule. Yeah. If right. anyone's on the ground at night, it's a, it's a Japanese. Yeah. So meanwhile, as this guy's running, someone else gets out of his foxhole to take him out, clubs him. With the, with the, it's a hard to believe the story, but it's true. Clubs him with the back of his rifle, knocks him out. He's now lying, moaning on the ground. Everyone gets back into their foxholes. They think, okay, we dealt with the Japanese. But he keeps moaning, so he thought he'd killed him, and he hasn't. And eventually another guy gets out and, go, and finishes him off with a pistol. In the morning, Eugene, who's been concerned all the way along that something's not right, right. goes over to the prone form, and it's one of their own men. Oh, God. And then he is called to the CP by ACAC, Captain Helding, the yeah. company commander, who asks him, did, did you see what happened last night? And, and my father said, yes, sir, I did. And so, and, and Captain Haldane said, look, it was a tragedy. It could have happened to anybody. Well, we won't talk of it anymore. The upshot of it is that the mortarmen in particular were upset at the guy who'd fallen asleep. And he, he wasn't, you know, he wasn't disciplined, as, as, uh, as Henry says, Haldane accepted it was an accident, but the reason it, the accident happened is because was he'd, fallen asleep. he'd fallen asleep. So God, he, easy he was called out by his guys. And he was ostracized. 
after that. And in my dad's unpublished writing, as I've told oh, you, that's, inter through, that's he's, interesting. He's, he's oh, that's a bit of extra information. He I speaks about get. that. I kind of assumed he would be, but he, he doesn't detail that. When you say unpublished, I mean, why is it unpublished? Well, it's the original manuscript to, uh, with the old breed that wasn't edited out. Wasn't edited out, and I'm going through that mining the un, the the edited out material to do a book of my own, interwoven with my voice of growing up. There's some really good stuff in there, and I'm not saying that out of 312 pages, which is what with the old breed published out at, I'm not saying there's 500 pages of material that should have been published. It's quite clear, as you can see, and Henry will know this from conversations with his dad, I'm sure, that the decision to cut it was not made on editorial grounds. It was made on grounds of, uh, of expense. Oh, sure. Very long. Uh, <laughs> and, and he also talks about, as they're going through the editing process, I just, I let them get on with it. I right. didn't take personal uh, charge of it because it would have been too upsetting for him to have seen so many bits that he'd written. And like, like I said yesterday, the letter he wrote to Bill Layden and Stumpy Stanley, and I brought that into my presentation yesterday because it, it just it summed up so much of what he felt. He thought he was going to write with the old breed, have that cathartic release of all this pent up, all these pent up mem memories, get it out there and then just forget about it. And, of course, the opposite happened. People wouldn't let him forget about it. Yeah, sure. Because they would start writing to him and wanting a piece of him. And Oh, he would get letters every day. The, I, the consolation, though, Henry, to, you're absolutely right. And it must, you know, in, in some ways, of course, there was no um, uh, ending, really, was there, to his torment, probably, totally. But the, the upside was the recognition, particularly from the guys in Company K, <clears throat> that what he'd written was their story and that they appreciated that. They felt that the story had that total degree of verisimilitude, accuracy, realism that it needed to have. Yep. And, and he definitely got endorsements from the Marine Corps. His buddies, that meant more than anything. It's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I, th I think the, the, the greatest war memoirs are the ones which are, are, are kind of honest and get the, and get the flavor of the... Um, of the conversation, the banter, the camaraderie. There's an awful lot of ones which are a bit kind of dear reader, a yeah. bit knowing, a bit kind of sort of winky, a bit kind of, you know. Uh, Almost but, in a didactic way, like instructing. Yeah, but, but yes, it, and just sort of, and, and so, uh, I suppose sort of, I, I don't know, you, you, you don't really feel that, you feel they're presenting a story through a lens which isn't actually the one that they experienced out at the time. It's, 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 it's too knowing, it's too laid back, it's too... I don't know, it just... Well, um, one of the things... Where, 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 where's what you, what you get with the old breed and what you get with, you know, and, and I think Caught It Safe Out Here and some of the other better ones, is you get this... It feels real. And it feels real because it is. Mm -hmm. Whereas a lot of these memoirs, it, it, it just doesn't, it, you know, there's an awful lot of, particularly of, of, of fighter pilots' memoirs, and it's all, you know, you don't... Yeah, you and I, I did this, and then I... And that's but, the, the, well, it, Pierre Klosterman is, is another really good one. Yes. It, it's an amazing, you know, The Big Show is one of the, one of the great memoirs as well, I think. Um, the one you edited and you found, basically, that's classic, was it First, first Light? Yeah. Um, remind me of the name of the pilot. Jeff Wellham. Jeff Wellham. The reason that's such a brilliant account is because, and this is similar actually, there are, there are uh, similarities with, with the old breed, is because there's no ego in it from Wellham. Wellham is telling a story of a big events that he was caught up in, just like your father. There's no ego, it's not about me, it's not about my experiences and, uh, that, that are important. It's just how I got through it. And Wellham is so honest about the fact that he doesn't think he shot anyone down, and if he well, shot anyone down, it was probably his own side. I mean, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. extraordinarily honest, and it's exactly the same with Sledgehammer, because he, he never says at any point, I was the hero, I did something heroic. Just surviving was, right. was the sort of, you know, the currency with which they were all, uh, under which they were all living. One or two of them did extraordinarily courageous acts, but it often led to their deaths, you know, it was just about surviving. Yeah, I suppose, I, I, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, the point about him is, and, and it's, I think it's quite similar to your father's situation, is that, that Jeff wrote this book in 1974, I think. And, you know, he'd been in the RAF. He, he stayed in the RAF after the war. Uh, he, was, he was, you know, flying spy missions over the Soviet Union um, in, um, you know, those kind of, what were those spy planes? They had? U2s. Cambras and, Cambras and U2, yeah, U2s, <laughs> he was flying U2s. And um, then his wife persuaded him to quit the RAF and join the kind of family firm, which was, I think was a kind of haulage firm, if I remember right. It was something like that. 
and it all went pear shaped and he lost all his money and they divorced and you know it just didn't work out and um so suddenly he he was broke divorced you know in his 50s without anything i mean well well what would he been yeah he'd been in his 40s i guess in, in, in yeah. the 1970s he was born in 1921 and thinking, what am, what am I doing? So he, he started to sit down and write about a time where he'd done something useful, is what he said. He said, oh, when, I was, when I was some use. And he never wrote it for an audience. It, it sat in the bottom of his desk until 2000. Wow. Which was, or 2001, I think it was, when I went to see him in Cornwall. And I went to interview him because I knew he was a Battle of Britain fighter pilot, and I was, I was working on a novel at the time and uh, with a sort of Battle of Britain backdrop. So I really got into the research, and that, that was really what sort of kick-started me into the whole thing, which was going off and seeing, interviewing these veterans. I just thought, God, that was absolutely incredible. And he was brilliant because we were in this pub down in Cornwall, and, you know, he was all picking up his pint glass and picking up the ashtray and sort of going, so here's me in this spit, and there's this 109, and, you know, kind of reenacting it in, uh, above the pub table. And he was sort of everything you could possibly hope for from a Battle of Britain fighter pilot, you know, great... Raconteur, really good fun to be around with, sense of humour, but also you could see there was a real vulnerability there. And in the course of the conversation, he said, "Well, you know, some years ago, I wrote, and he told me the story about writing this this, this book." And I said to him, uh, "I said," and he said, "said there's a chapter in it which is a sort of a bit like a day in the life of a Battle of Britain pilot, and you might find that quite useful to read." So anyway, when I got back home, I wrote to him and said, "You know, it's great to see you. Thanks so much. You, you mentioned this book. You know, any chance I could could read the whole thing? I'd, you know, I'd be thrilled to." Anyway, literally about four days later, the manuscript, there was only one, arrived in the post. He, and obviously he was writing it for himself, wasn't he? It was a cathartic experience process, to get it yeah. off his, uh, to get off his chest as part of the kind of healing process. Yeah, and, and I, that, that really is. I mean, I remember my mother in the late 70s, as she typed more and more of it, saying, this is, this is powerful. You know, let, let, you should, I think people would want to read this. And yeah. that typically self-deprecating way of sledgehammer, he, he was like, who the hell wants to read it? This is for you and Henry and John mm. to know, to have some knowledge of what I saw and went through. But to your point earlier, I mean, one of the things, and Saul, I know you picked up on this in, in Devil Dogs. I'm sure it was mentioned somewhere in there. I certainly saw my father talk about this in some letters that I've unearthed at Auburn. One of the things he felt that was not acknowledged properly was just the filth the degrading conditions, you know, I can, I can remember him in his own voice describing, you know, <clears throat> by the end of the third day, you and your foxhole buddy were complaining to each other about how bad they smelled. You had no way to, if you had on pillow, if you had to defecate, you just did it in the, the coral. Yeah. <clears throat> you the had no way to get yourself clean. I mean, he said, movies, he said, it is a disgusting topic, but nobody ever talked about that in fear and filth as an infantryman went hand in hand. Yeah, and I think this is really interesting, isn't it? Because, I, you know, obviously I'm doing this work on, at the moment on, on the Italian campaign, and that's, you know, what those guys had to put up with, you know, the winter conditions, the wet, the cold, the filth, mm -hmm. you know, mud absolutely everywhere. And you, and you go from this, this sort of first world environment in the USA or UK or whatever, and suddenly you're in this totally, totally alien environment. And you're expected to degrade your standard of living to just an astonishing degree. And of course, most people just you just do, and you just take it on the chin, and you just you just get on with it. But I mean, I remember we had Max Hastings on, and he was talking about that. You know, he was talking about about the the, the, the physical and mental toll of forget the shooting, just the conditions. Right. Yeah, because and, and suddenly you you know you're in Peleliu, this kind of was it seven miles by three or whatever it is, or five miles, miles by two. Miles yeah, yeah. Miles. I mean it's, it's tiny and, and and there's no escape. There's no escape. Once you, once you're there, you're there until you either die, you're wounded, or or the battle's over. The, and the things that <clears throat> the way I saw that manifest itself in, in the <clears throat> the living conditions. I mean, I remember as a teenager, I asked my my father, like, why don't you ever grow a beard? I literally never saw my father unshaven. And he just, of course, he talked about it with the old breed, but I remember him telling me, he said, look, I had to go 30-plus days on Peleliu, 80-something days on Okinawa <clears throat> without shaving. He said, "I, for the life of me, I can't understand why a guy who has a choice to shave or grow a beard would grow a beard. <laughs> he said it itched, it, it got filth, rifle oil. Yep. He said, it, it was just, I hated that feeling of being unshaven. And Saul, um, when you when you started on this, I mean, you, you'd done your book on Okinawa, so I guess you were braced for what you were going to kind of uncover. But I mean, how did you come about 
going to Company K? Because uh, I mean, you know, I, I know why I chose the Sherwood Rangers, for example. But but you know, how did how did how did they come a calling to you? I already had a pretty strong idea that I was going to follow Company K in a subsequent book when I was writing Okinawa, Crucible of Hell, mm-hmm. because for two reasons. One, you had to have a solid underpinning of of witness witnesses because no one was still around or, pr- or virtually no one was still around at that time that was 2019 2018 I think when I started work and so you had to have a a, a, a decent oral record and that the underpinning for the book was three or four very comprehensive accounts one of which of course was with the old breed and what's interesting about with the old breed is that it spawned the others in other words if with the old breed had never been written we would know n- we wouldn't know about the second half of K Company's story, that is Peleliu and Ocanal, and we certainly wouldn't know about the first part, which is Guadalcanal and New Britain. So you, I had these four memoirs. What I didn't know is how much else I could piece together, um, but I was pretty convinced that if I was going to choose Company K, I didn't want to use hardly any of the material in Crucible of Hell. So Crucible of Hell, Sledgehammer's mentioned a couple of times, Basically, all the best material I kept back deliberately for the second book, and one I sort of. And you said that on Paul and Ed's show. I Parliament did mention that. I did. Okay, exactly sorry, I, I wasn't sure I'd, I'd said that before. <clears throat> and the second reason Company K is so perfect is because, as the subtitle of the book says, is there at the beginning and it's there at the end. It is first off the Higgins, very. Uh, there's a Higgins um, uh, boat in the museum. You know, when you look at them, you realise this is just wooden, you know, right. with, a, with a with a steel ramp. Yes. That's what they went into Guadalcanal on. I mean, you, basically no protection at all. And when the ramp goes down, you, can you imagine if this was on uh, Omaha Beach, you've just got the fire coming straight into the front of this packed vehicle. I mean, completely uh, inappropriate, frankly, for amphibious landing, but it's all they had at the time. Anyway, they're there at the beginning, and they, as a unit, are there still fighting at the end of Okinawa. So you can trace the story of the Pacific War through a single company. It was absolutely perfect, and it had this wonderful oral record with, I mean, let's face it, as you've already pointed out, the greatest mem- memoir, not only of the Pacific, not only of the Second World War, but, you know, arguably uh, one of the greatest of all time. Yep. So it seemed too good to, uh, too good an opportunity not to take. I loved In Devil Dogs the way <clears throat> that you, and I picked it up when, obviously I read the manuscript when Saul sent it to me before it got published, but when the book got published and you sent it to me, then I went back through and made notes and everything to be prepared for this. But one of my favorite campaigns, don't ask me why, but Milne Bay in New Guinea, fascinated by that action. I didn't know until rereading Devil Dogs that K Company staged out of Milne Bay to go to Cape Gloucester. When I saw that, I'm like highlighting it and making note, you know, because Milne Bay was so obscure and it was a horrific action primarily by Australians, but like, wow, K Company staged from Milne Bay to Cape Gloucester, and I'm correct in that, right? Yeah, absolutely right, and, and what, what, what I think what's Which important. my father wasn't there, that, pre- yeah, yeah, that sure. was before him. So Henry's obviously familiar with, uh, as is everyone who's read with the old read, with, with the second half of the story, and if you watch the Pacific miniseries, uh, yeah. with the old read was one of the source books used for that, K Company only come into the story at Peleliu, Right. So it's this beginning bit of the. This is this is yep. in, in terms of historiography. Obviously, I've expanded on on with the Aubrey because that was entirely through um, uh, Eugene's eyes. You couldn't say you've improved on it, of course, because how can you improve on a classic? You, you've you've given it context. But what I what I've done more importantly than that, I think, is 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 start the story of K Company from the beginning. So when uh, Eugene introduces characters in with the old breed, like Snafu, this classic character who's from Louisiana. I mean, this, you know, we're, we're now in his home state. Um, and Henry was telling the story about how he, he goes to visit them. And he's like, his voice is so thick. It's sort of a Cajun voice. You can yeah, almost not <clears throat> Snafu, understand yeah. him. He and, he and his wife came to visit my dad in 1984. And, and I, do you want me to tell that story, Saul? I didn't want to answer. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna, what, what we'll do is we'll, we'll just take a quick break here. And I'm going to let you finish your eggs and grits. Um, and then we'll come back to that anecdote. 
Well, welcome back to We Have Ways to Make You Talk with me, James Holland, and with Henry Sledge and Saul David here in New Orleans. You can probably hear the little bit of jazz going on in the background. Um, it is, of course, the jazz capital of the world, I guess, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. I, mean, I think this so. Is, this is where it all began, isn't it? Home, so, of, home of the old-fashioned and the uh, uh, jazz. We've, we've had Louis we've Armstrong. Had one or two, uh, and we've listened to a bit of jazz, so it's been great. And we're going to get a little bit more of a snapshot today when we head to the French quarter. Yes. Yes, absolutely. But anyway, we're, we're talking Pacific and um, Eugene Sledge. And I, I'm so fascinated by, that, by, the, by the legacy of war and how people just, who, who get taken out of their, their ordinary, comfortable first world lives, transported into this total hell and mayhem, and then expected to just go back and get on with their lives. Uh, and obviously your father made a really good fist of it and, and had an incredibly successful academic career, didn't he? He did. Was, a, was he a biologist? He was right? a PhD in biology. And, and he taught that at, he, at, he taught at university? Biology, yes. And wrote this incredible memoir and brought up two sons and looked after his wife and was a good husband and father. He, he was, and that's, you know, in my own work that I'm eventually going to get out there as, as soon as I can. I want to bring... One of the things that resonates with me, and I feel driven to do this, is because people saw the Pacific, the way it goes under the rim of the helmet and shows that psychological cost, which I spoke of a little bit yesterday. But the thing about my father was he, he was so good at compartmentalizing. He preached to me self-control, which I have not exercised as well as he did in his life. I'm trying, but I know that he did not want to inflict those demons on his family. And for people who saw the Pacific or saw Ken Burns' The War, and they spoke of, of how he struggled when he came home, and he did. They all did. But yep. the, the, the point I want to be living proof as I carry his legacy forward in, in my own puny way, that he mastered his demons. Yep. He conquered them. He had a successful career. He was married to my mother almost 50 years by the time he passed away. He, he was a paragon of self-control and, and not inflicting the bad stuff on his family. I mean, I, you know, I told you the anecdote of watching Patton and him, you know, yeah, yeah. sneaking up on him and, 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 and there were, I mean, but he really tried to, to just minimize that. But, you know, me looking through the life, pictorial history of World War II or what are you know, reading the old breed by George McMillan, the division history, you know, I just formed a love and a, and a passion and an interest for it. You know, Robert Leckie's Helmet for My Pillow. I mean, I remember reading... Well, that's another really, really good book, isn't it? I mean, yeah, it's, and it's I, I read, book. like, I had the first edition. Something, I think, it, when my dad sent stuff to Auburn, that copy got away somehow. I've since got another first edition for my own use, but for my own reading. But I had his first edition where he made notes in it because he was reading that thinking in his own mind. Did he, his, ever, did he ever know Leckie? He did not. It's it's not inconceivable that they could have met. Now you know the scene that they had in, in the Pacific where he and Lecky had the conversation in the tent. <clears throat> um, that was artistic license. But H two one and K three five, you know the first Marines and fifth Marines, and obviously the seventh Marines. The entire first division was on Pavuvu uh, after Cape Gloucester preparing for Peleliu. So it it's not beyond conception that they could have met. Right, but they were. But they didn't know each other. Yeah, they were two point. enlisted guys. I mean, who you yeah. know, who was going to know that Robert Leckie would go on to write a classic, and then Eugene Sledge, a number of years later, would get his own classic published. There was no way they sure. they could have known that. But they, they could have crossed paths. I mean, certainly with Sid Phillips, who was in H two one H Company Second Battalion First Marines with Leckie, you know, and he was my father's best friend from Mobile. Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Phillips and uh, your dad did meet on. Pavuvu. They is did. That, is that right? Briefly. That is correct. Course. Yeah. The, the, the way they film it is exactly, exactly right. You know, my dad finally gets out in theater. Um, <clears throat> and it's, it, it's funny though, isn't it? Because because the Pacific doesn't get the kind of hasn't got the kind of deep love that Band of Brothers sort of generated. But but I've got to say, I thought it was fantastic. I mean, I, I, I remember seeing seeing going through. A, I had to do a review of it, I think, and I, I remember going to see a, a, a trailer of it in a movie theater, and and it was you know cinema, and it was just. I thought it was stunning. And I, I know that they used real blank ammunition, so, so the, the, they didn't put sound effects in for the weapons, that it was real weapons firing and things like that. So, you, you know, in a, in a cinema, it seemed incredibly loud and, right. and, 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 and real. I thought it was a brilliant series. I, I but think the Pacific has aged incredibly well. As, as yeah. I told Saul, 
I didn't like it at first. Did I you was, not? I did not. I was so close to the story, and Bruce McKenna and I are, are dear friends. We've had some great reunions and great conversations about this, and he knows now that I love it. I, because at first I was expecting Band of Brothers, and I remember him telling me, it's not going to be Band of Brothers. It's not one unit through the entire war. It's it's going to be different. It's more about the individual experience. And after coming back to it and rewatching it, I told him, now it makes sense. Mm. Now I understand it, and I love it. I mean, I... Uh, do you think it's a fair depiction of your father? I do. I think they captured the essence of his character. I have said, you know, I thought Joe Mazzello did a fantastic job playing the role. I have said I think the real Sledgehammer was maybe a little more likable than than the way Joe portrayed him. And that's not a knock against Joe at all. I don't mean it that way, but I just there were some scenes on Okinawa, you know, where uh, again with Ham, the the fictitious character. Um, I don't think dialogue like that really occurred. But, again, I'm not knocking the miniseries for no, them. No, no, sure. You know, look, they took a tremendous amount of artistic license with Leckie's character. Yeah. that You just do that when you're making a film. Of you course. Know? Um, <clears throat> so Leckie wasn't like the character in, he's portrayed? Well, no, I'm not saying that. I'm just... He probably was, but I'm just saying there was a certain amount of artistic license. Right. Um, and I just reread Helmet for my pillow and, and it, for probably the third time, you know, and it became clear to me that, yeah, okay, they changed some things with the Lakey character, just like they did with the, the Sledge character. Right. Which is perfectly understandable. I mean, like, on, it, it actually was on Ingecebus, which is a little island about 300 yards off the northern tip of Peleliu, where the, the episode where you see it's in part seven of the Pacific, where Snafu's lobbing cor- little pieces of coral into the open skull of the Japanese machine Yes, yes, gun. yes. <clears throat> and, and they don't portray that as being on Ingecebus because I remember Richard Frank telling me this. He said, look, it gets down to budget. It, to fire up those LVTs costs a lot of money. And yeah. so they're just going to they're gonna have the bunker episode as if it's on the West Road <clears throat> and not, mm. which because Ingecebus was actually on D plus 13. Right. 13 days into the battle, another amphibious landing yep. off the northern tip of Peleliu. Yep. Which you talked about very well in Devil Dogs, but, yeah. but you know they have to they have to condense things and. and My take on uh, I've come around to Pacific uh, like you, Henry, and I obviously I had different reasons for not being entirely convinced about it. The reason I wasn't convinced about it, it is only because I framed it through the lens of uh, what was the first one? Band of Brothers. Is only because I framed it through the lens of Band of Brothers. Band of Brothers has that narrative coherency by following a single unit. There wasn't a book. Devil Dogs didn't exist 25 years ago. No. So right. they couldn't do the first part of the story. And they wanted to tell the whole Pacific, including Iwo Jima. They were, they were greedy. They wanted to tell right. every episode. No single unit was in all of those battles. The 1st Marine Division didn't fight at Iwo Jima. So if you want to include Iwo, Iwo Jima and you want the story of uh, Barcelona in Guadalcanal, you have to jump around the units. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so they did that, but the portrayal of the experience in the Pacific is utterly brilliant. Yeah, yeah, it and is. it's beautifully it's shot. Yep. And of course there are, there's artistic license, and as you say, but I think they stayed true, and you'll have to confirm this, to the spirit of your dad. They did, absolutely. And I think they did the same with Lucky. Saul, when you would, you know, when you would, you'd obviously touched on the awfulness of the Pacific War when you were doing Okinawa. But, I mean, I mean, I, I get asked sometimes, you know, don't you get a bit depressed by constantly writing about people getting killed and the horrors of war and all the rest of it? And, and kind of, I, I do get depressed, but I just find the whole thing just so compelling. endlessly compelling and fascinating. I mean, how did you get on with it? Because you're, 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 you're telling some terrible stories, aren't you? I mean, and, and, you know, you can get through the European War and barely see a German. You know, you might see a dead German, but you, you, you know, you, you, there are occasions of street fighting, you know, there's obviously the Stalingrad, then there's, the, the, there's Ortona, for example, in Italy. You know, there's obviously times where, it, where fighting is quite close quarters, but for the most part, the fighting in Europe isn't particularly close quarters. But it nearly always is against the Japanese. You know, whether you're in the jungle up in Burma and northeast, um, north, uh, northeast India, or whether you're on Saipan or Peleliu or Okinawa, it's incredibly close-quarter stuff, isn't it? And so there is that, there is that visceral violence 
of man against man, tearing, trying to gouge eyeballs out with your bare hands, you know, swords, bayonets, clubbing people in the middle of the night. You know, it's, 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 it's really kind of hands-on in a, in a kind of, in a truly awful way. I mean, it's medieval, isn't it? Yeah, it's war and it's rawest. But I, I felt a little bit like uh, Eugene did when he was putting this together. If you're going to tell it, you have to tell it as it is. You can't yeah. sanitise it. Too many people watch war films or they read <laughs> novels or they read some history. I, there's a very good reviewer, actually, in the UK, who reviews for The Times, who says, if you're going to write... He like, loves your books, by the way. He says, if you're going to write history, tell it how it is. Don't try and sanitise it. Don't just try and make it seem like battles are, are all about formations moving here, there and everywhere. You have to have the details so people understand what war is like. If you sanitise it, it's too easy to launch war. You know, so there is a real purpose, I think, as an educative purpose for us as historians to uh, reproduce as closely as we can without getting into... I mean, some people would, would call it war porn. I don't think it's war porn at all. I think if you read one of my books, you think we should never go to war and if we have to it should be short and we should have proper objectives the, the, <clears> most <throat> of our books in, in my view are anti-war they do not glorify war and the more honest you are about what war is like the better that, that's a good point because with the old breed I think it's a juxtaposition it, he, he, my father was fiercely proud of having been a marine proud of the marine corps proud of their service proud of his service proud of their record and yet, with the old breed, is a powerful anti-war book in its way. Yeah. Yes, it, it balances those two things beautifully, doesn't it? And I think the other point to make, which is what he brings out so well, Henry, is for all the horror of war, it also brings out some of the most noble elements of the human spirit. You know, this self-sacrifice, this determination to keep going for the sake of your mates. You know, that's why the whole right. British regimental system works so well. But of course, in in the American system, the company is key. That's family, that's home. And you will do almost anything for the brothers in that group, you know, brothers in arms. You know, you, you described your recent book about the tank regiment. It's so true, isn't it? They'll do almost anything for each other. And that's pretty extraordinary if you think about life and how we look after number one or we look after our family. To have this kind of broader network in which you're all pu pulling uh, for the same end, which is survival, but also, you know, you hope a nobler end, and certainly the Second World War was a nobler end. And, and how did some of the other characters get on? I mean, Snafu and Phillips and stuff. I mean, how did they get on? How did they adjust to life after the war? Well, <clears throat> Snafu, I think, adjusted well. He, he was in, in Louisiana, you know, here and not far from here. Everybody uh, suffers in one form or another by the experience of two things actually one I think everyone feels survivor's guilt I mean imagine all those guys who didn't come back and right. by you know incredible good fortune and uh, Eugene was completely unique in not having a scratch on him I mean he'd been through two of the most brutal battles I've ever written about and he came out with I mean he I think he had a little nick, didn't he, at one point, but it was not a serious wound at all. Correct. And he had a concussion from a close shell hit, probably more than once, actually. But he goes into that more in the unpublished writing on, on Okinawa, but not to interrupt you. So they're suffering from uh, survivor's guilt. Why, 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 why did we come through? You know, the better men die is a sort of sense that some, some veterans uh, have. But also, they've got to literally live with the effects of it, the psychological effects, the nightmares. So I think, you know, when you look in the post-war story of a lot of the guys from Company K, you see pretty severe uh, PTSD. Uh, Miller, who's one of the characters I introduced right at the beginning of the book, who fights in the two campaigns that Eugene doesn't, which is why they never meet right. or they never met during active service, uh, is it goes back to the coal mining business in West Virginia, where he came from. And it's a brutal civilian life, mm. not made any easier by the fact that he's suffering recurring nightmares and psychological disorders. And he, wow. he describes at one point in his wonderful memoir, Earned in Blood, which I quote from liberally in the book, needless to say, that but for his wife, he probably would have committed suicide. She gets him through yes, it. Yes, I remember you saying so that. So there are severe um, reactions from a lot of the guys uh, Bergen also talks about mental difficulties, and a lot of them, I think, uh, are, are suffering. But what brings it all together for them is not just the writing of, with the old breed, which is a great moment for everyone because they can now relive and process. It's all those reunions that are really beginning to gather steam 
particularly in the late 70s and early 80s when I think your dad uh, first starts attending. He started going to 1st Marine Division reunions. It, it would have been after after With the Old Breed was published, so post-81. And, and that, was a, that was a wonderful process because he you know, reconnected with, or he had, he had already talked to guys like Bergen and Bill Layden. And, um, and Bill Layden was just a wonderful guy. I mean, he, he would, in fact, Bill Layden, who I, I love the way he was portrayed in the Pacific, um, but Bill was a wonderful man. He was, the first, he was the first guy I called the day my dad died. So what happened to your dad? When did he pass he away? He had stomach cancer. He passed oh, away no. in March of 2001. So he'd have been, what, 80 then? He was 77. 77. That's too young, isn't it, really? I remember talking to Bill Pierce, who was in the Marines. He was, I can't remember which, which, but he was on Okinawa. He's an Okinawa vet. Great character. And I remember, I remember him telling me that at the end of the war, I, you know, I asked him, you know, had, he, had he ever suffered? And he said, no. He said, never suffered at all. And he said, what happened was after, after Okinawa, they went to some base in China or something like that. And, and basically, you know, he hauled himself silly for mm-hmm. a, a two weeks, got drunk every night. Um, then went home to New York where his parents were. He sat down and told his parents absolutely everything. No detail left out. Then bought a motorbike, went on a huge road trip, came back and he was done. He was fine. And he never, he said, I've never had a nightmare in my life. And, he, and you know, I mean, he's, he was obviously an incredibly phlegmatic character and, and um, an eternal optimist, I would say, in life. And, you know, he, it just worked for him, but everyone's <laughs> different and... I, I would I would guess that he's the exception, really. My father always credited my grandfather because my grandfather had yes. been, a sur- or been a doctor in the First World War. I mean. In the First World War, he did not go overseas. He stayed stateside, but he was a physician his entire life. But he he was a doctor. He treated shell they called it shell shock back then, shell shock victims of World War One. And of course, they have a very poignant scene in the Pacific, <clears throat> you know, where they they have some good lines from my grandfather on that, but. You know, my, my my grandmother, of course, just didn't get it. She would hassle my father about, why are you sitting around? You know, what are you going to do with yourself? And and my grandfather provided a bulwark against that because he understood. And, he, and he, the advice he gave my father was read good books, engage yourself intellectually. If It's okay to drink alcohol, but don't become a slave to it. Don't Don't let it rule you. And, and just don't feel sorry for yourself. Because he, he told my father, you, what you went through, what you and your buddies went through, was as bad as anything anybody could have gone through, with the exception of someone who had been a POW of the Japanese. And my father understood that, you know, and so I think he, he tried to have that govern his thought process. And at times it was more challenging than others, but he was a man of incredible self-discipline. But it, but also he had a he had a good life, didn't he? And, he and, did, and and a contented life, you know. Very so, much so, very um, much so. So you know he he was incredibly lucky for someone who's been unlucky enough to live through that period and have to go up and fight. He was one of the lucky ones, wasn't he? I, I yes, and he would have said that. You know, I mean, he survived it. He had his arms, his legs, his eyes, his ears. Yeah, he was physically intact. Mm-hmm. You know, and that was more than could be said for a, a lot of veterans who came home. But you can also see that in in his writing and in his uh, in his decision to write the old, with the old breed, he was suffering. You know, he had demons for a, a chunk of his life. Now, of course, they didn't stop him functioning. No, but they probably were never absent either. If you know what I mean. I mean, having been through the occasional up and down psychologically, it's an incredibly disorientating experience to just have things going on. Um, and you you just get a tiny little little window into into what that must be like. The, the scene, and, and they filmed it exactly what I remember my father telling me about, remember in part 10 of the Pacific when he goes to Auburn to register for classes. And I remember him telling me, the young lady sitting there, well, so you were in the Marine Corps, did they teach you about mechanical things? He was like, no ma'am. Did they teach you about electrical, electricity, how to repair electrical things? And, you know, he said, no ma'am. And, and there's this queue of young students behind him and after about the fourth question of did the Marine Corps teach you this or that, you know, and he keeps telling her, no, they didn't teach me that. And he hears people start to kind of start tittering around him. And he, and he, he, and she's like, what, did the Marine Corps teach you anything that you can do here at Polytech? Because that's what they called Auburn back then. And he says, lady, they taught me how to kill Japs. <laughs> wow. Yeah. 
And she kind of recoils. And, and my father was the consummate gentleman, and he checked himself and said there was a killing war going on, and I had to do some of the killing. And she said, well, I'm, I'm sorry. And he said, it, it's okay. You didn't understand. But it just in that moment, lady, they taught me how to kill Japs. Yeah, yeah, well. Wow. There's a scene in Crucible of Hell right at the end of the book. In fact, it may even be the last scene in Crucible of Hell where uh, one of my key characters is back in civilian life. And he's walking yep. down a street. I think he's in New York. He's in a big city somewhere. And he said, everyone around me thought I was just like them. I looked like them. I was dressed like them. But I wasn't like them. I'd been to a place I could never properly come back from. I had seen wow, yeah, savagery yeah, yeah. on an unimaginable like that. scale. And yeah. that changed everything for me forever. All right. And I'm not saying your dad was as extreme as that, but I think there's an element of that to all these guys when they come back. How do you retain? It's a question you asked earlier, Jamie. It's a brilliant question. It's a question every military has to understand. People have got to be able to decompress to get back into civilian life. And the question is, how best do you do that? Do you have lots of expensive follow-up treatment, or do you, as I, I gather some of the military are trying these days, the British and the Americans, to get combat veterans to talk about what they've gone through with each other close to the actual events as possible so that they get it out of their system and they, they can argue and they can say what the hell was going on, why did you do this, why were decisions made, but just be honest about what they've gone through and generally speaking that's not what happens, the, the natural reaction is as it must have been for Eugene which is to bottle things up and say I couldn't cope, I just need to put this out of my mind. But by not dealing with it, of course, it will never entirely go away. Two fantastic books um, with the old breed and uh, devil dogs. So, Henry, thank you. And, Henry, very um, salivating for the prospect of your book and also a kind of unedited version of with the old breed. Chaps, thank you very much. I um, hope everyone's um, enjoyed that one. I certainly did. I thought it was completely fascinating. Cheerio for now. <laughs>